Welcome to Process Control Design and Practice. My name is Tom Meadowcroft. In this video, we will learn about batch phases. This is the third of the videos looking at sequential logic and batch control. We've learned about sequential function charts, batch recipes, and the S88 standard. In this video, we're focusing on the action statements in batch recipes, the phases, and how to use them and how to write them. A unit is made up of several equipment modules. Collections of control modules or devices that can carry out a task for that unit. A phase for an equipment module is the sequential logic that accomplishes one task. Examples. A reactor exit piping equipment module could have a phase for circulating and sampling the reactor and a second phase for discharging. A batch reactor could have a pressure equipment module that has a phase that vents positive pressure and a second phase that pulls vacuum with a vacuum pump. Phases may have parameters which are specific target numbers or instructions to the phase from the recipe that direct how to carry out the phase's task. If our positive pressure phase is called pause press, it would need a parameter to tell it what pressure to target, let's say in bars. It might need another parameter which instructs whether the vent discharge is to go to an acid absorber or to a scrubber. So when we use it in the batch recipe, the phase name will appear with a number and a word following it in brackets, like pause press 2.5 comma absorber, telling the phase to control at two and a half bar and exhaust to the acid absorber, or pause press 1.8 comma scrubber, to control at 1.8 bar and exhaust to the scrubber. When we write the phase as opposed to writing the batch recipe, when we're writing the phase, pause press will have two parameter variables. Press target, which will be a real variable that holds our target set point, and path, which will be a string variable assigned the value either absorber or scrubber each time the phase is executed by a unit recipe. Let's write the sequential function chart for pause press one of the phases in the pressure equipment module. We see the two parameters in the title block. First, we would check to make sure the vacuum part of a pressure equipment module is sealed, as it would be counterproductive and possibly dangerous to try to pull vacuum and vent positive pressure at the same time. Note, to close the vacuum control valve, we put the vacuum controller, PC-R1V, in manual mode and set its output directly, which controls the valve position, to zero. Next, we'll open one vent valve and close the other based on the value of path using a decision branch. Remember, path was the instruction from the recipe to either go to the absorber or the scrubber. Finally, we'll make sure the positive pressure controller, PC-R1P, is in automatic mode and make it set point equal to the press target parameter. Now let's look at the batch charge equipment module for R1. All the valves, pumps, and sensors needed to complete batch charges are in this module. There are two tanks, T1 and T2. T1 is the condensate receiver. We'll have a phase that charges that receiver to R1. You can read about that in the text. Let's instead write the phase T2 charge with the parameter charge target, which charges charge target kilograms of the raw material in T2 to R1. T2 has its own pump and a recirculation line, which is nice because that allows us to establish a good flow through the pump before we start the reactor charge. FTR1 is a mass flow meter that will read a flow rate in kilograms per minute. The circle next to it, F tote R1, means that the flow meter has a totalizer, which integrates the total mass that is passed. We'll want to zero that totalizer before we start charging. The control valve FCV R1 
will allow us to change the speed of the charge. The SV valves with the square tops are solenoid block valves, open or closed. So a sequence moves a process through a series of states, as we discussed. What states do we need in our sequence? First, good practice is to start any sequence that moves fluids with everything closed and shut down, because we don't know what has happened before the phase was started by the batch recipe. Remember, we need to make sure everything associated with T1 is closed and shut down as well. The transition that follows is to check that all of these actions are complete, all the valves are closed and pumps off. We'll need to zero the totalizer. Let's do that here. Next, we should open the valves to allow T2 to recirculate, then start it circulating. That should be done as two steps because if SVT2 fails to open, we don't want to start P2 and damage it for lack of feed. Then, we start charging by opening the path to the reactor. How fast should we charge? Generally as fast as possible. Time is money in a batch plant. The only problem with running as fast as possible is that we want to satisfy the target mass objective precisely. And that will be a challenge running at full speed and suddenly stopping. It would be like driving at 100 miles per hour down a road and then hitting the brakes at the very last possible moment to try to stop exactly at a stop sign. The traffic police would not approve, and your precision at the stop line would be terrible. This is why we have the control valve FCVR1. If we slow down to charge the last few hundred kilograms before the end of the charge, we can stop at the target much more precisely than if we were going at full speed. This is sometimes referred to as a trickle charge. The engineer will determine by trial and error a sufficiently large trickle charge mass, which we'll label T2 trickle mass. Then we'll run at full speed until the totalizer reaches charge target minus T2 trickle mass. At that point, we'll close SC FCVR1 to an appropriately small opening, say 30%, and wait to finish the charge. With the charge complete, we then shut everything down. That phase is correct, but it could be better. We shut down everything in the equipment module as our first action, but then we just assume that everything that the phase didn't move stayed where it was supposed to be. That is a bad practice. Valves and pumps can be adjusted manually by operators, and we shouldn't assume that they haven't been, particularly if something failed to work properly and the phase got stalled waiting at one of those transitions. Wherever possible, the best practice when writing a phase is to set the value of every device in the equipment module at every action step. As you can imagine, that makes for lengthy action sequential function charts if there are 10 or 20 control modules in the equipment module. A handy design tool is therefore a phase state table. Let's give a label to the states we proceed through. We'll call the start and end state idle because everything's off. Then we'll call the next T2 recirc path open when we get ready to recirculate. Then T2 recirc with the pump on. Then T2 fast for full speed charge and T2 trickle for the trickle charge. We can fill in the table. I've used color to show the devices which are not in their passive or safe state. This transforms the sequential function chart into a very easy to read document. Execute T2 recirc means send every command in the T2 recirc column of the phase state table. The transition that follows it T2 research status is true if the feedback for every device in the equipment module shows its status matches the command T2 research. So P1 is stopped, SVT2 is open, and so on. Organizing a phase like this makes both your job and the programmer's job easier because the completeness cuts down on errors. 
Phase state cables are optional, but a good practice where there are more than a few devices in an equipment module whenever you're writing a specification for a phase. What does it mean when a unit recipe sends a command for a phase to execute? Unit recipes often reside in a batch recipe manager application on a server for the whole plant. The unit specific phases, on the other hand, will reside on the high speed controllers that are also cycling control loops and interlocks several times a second. A phase sits idle until it is called to action by a recipe. And then ideally it runs to completion with no complications. But as with all things in a process plant, we have to plan for when things might go wrong. For instance, in a batch process, if a potential hazard is detected, interlocks or an operator might react by pausing or stopping an entire batch recipe or just a specific phase. The S88 standard has a phase procedural model that addresses this, which all the control system manufacturers support. In the upper left, you see idle, running, and complete, describing normal operation as we just said. So we're idle until the recipe tells us to start, and then we're running, and we're running through all the code that we've just created. And when the code is complete, we go to complete. But there are three other paths to exit running other than completing. Hold, stop, and abort. Each triggers a mini sequence different from the normal path to completion. Hold is the case where we wish the phase to stop progressing, but allow restarting later to finish the phase normally. Stop and abort don't allow restart. The phase will not complete. By convention, abort is an emergency shutdown that takes the equipment module to its safe state as fast as possible. While stop is a normal shutdown that may take longer to protect some piece of equipment or avoid harming a quality variable. Often the stop and abort sequences are the same, but not always. Hold is trickier because we have to pause whatever it is we're doing and then pick a re-entry point to the regular sequence that allows a restart of normal completion. The holding, restarting, stopping, and aborting on this diagram represent the little mini sequences that we need to specify for every phase to allow these functions. So let's go back to the T2 charge phase. If we're in the middle of a charge and wish to stop or abort, we'll just execute idle in our phase state table. There's nothing to cool down or drain, no kinder, gentler stopping method, so abort and stop will be identical for this phase. If the phase is asked to hold, we'll also want to execute idle because we need to stop fluid moving as we pause. But once we're held, how should we restart the phase? Some but not all of the charge will be complete. It's vital that we don't re-zero the flow totalizer, but otherwise we just want to start normally again. So we'll point restart at the step just after we zero the totalizer. The charge will then restart from where it left off and proceed to completion normally. Holding, stopping, and aborting sequences are pretty obvious for most phases, but occasionally can be tricky. In some cases of complex phases, more than one hold, stop, or abort sequence has to be defined depending on which step we are in in the execution of the phase when normal operation is interrupted. Remember to address the need for these extra sequences when writing a phase. In this video, we learned about writing phases. There are several more examples in the text that you should review, as well as a section on a special case, phases that don't end normally, but just keep running until a batch ends. Read through chapter seven and complete the exercises at the end to really learn this material. Look for a full text, exercises, and more videos at chemicalengineeringpractice.org. I'm Tom Meadowcroft. I hope to see you again soon.